Petra Patsika. Petra Patsika was a 24 year old computer science major at a college in Braunschweig, Germany. In July of 1984, with the holidays fast approaching, she planned to spend her time completing her thesis at her parents' house in Wolfsburg, some 23 miles away. While getting ready to leave on July 26, Petra asked a neighbor to take care of her plants while she was gone, giving no indication that anything was wrong. She then attended an appointment at her dentist's office, after which she apparently planned to catch a bus to Wolfsburg. However, Petra never arrived at her parents' home. At first, they thought she'd stayed near school a few days longer than expected, but when Petra did not arrive for her brother Karsten's birthday party two days later, her parents reported her missing. An extensive search was carried out for her, but nothing turned up. There was no sign of her at all. She was nowhere to be found on campus, not in her dorm or any common areas. Her professors hadn't seen her, and her friends had not heard from her. It was as if she had simply disappeared. Her case was also featured on a local television program, but still no trace of her was found. After finding no evidence of her, investigators began to suspect that Petra may have been a victim of homicide. The police changed the direction of the case from missing person to a murder investigation. This led to their first break in the case. Just two years prior, a 14-year-old girl had been brutally assaulted and murdered in the town of Wolfsburg. The police thought that the two crimes, Petra's disappearance and that of the little girls, were related. As it turned out, the patch of woodland where they found the 14-year-old girl was very close to the bus stop where Petra had supposedly caught the bus on the night of her disappearance. Then, in 1985, a 19-year-old known only as Gunter K, a carpenter's apprentice, was arrested in connection with the teenager's murder. He confessed to killing the 14-year-old. Then, two years later, he also confessed to having killed Petra as well. However, authorities started to doubt Gunter's claim. Investigators found no evidence that linked him to Petra's murder. He was eventually only convicted of the murder of the 14-year-old, and not of Petra's murder. In 1989, five years after Petra's disappearance, she was officially declared dead, even though her body had never been recovered. And for more than three decades, her disappearance remained unsolved. Then, in September of 2015, 31 years after and 200 miles away from the place where Petra had been last seen, police were called to the home of an old woman named Miss Schneider to investigate a break-in. Upon arrival, they questioned Miss Schneider about what had happened during the break-in, but when the police asked her for her identification, she was unable to give them any form, no license, passport, or anything. When the police questioned her later that night, it turned out Miss Schneider was actually Petra Pashtika. Furthermore, she produced documents that confirmed it. She admitted that she had planned her own disappearance from Braunschweig, saving some 4,000 douche marks in order to start a new life. After staging her disappearance, Petra had moved to an apartment that she'd rented in a city 35 miles northeast of Düsseldorf called Gelsenkirchen. She then eventually traveled cross country before finally making her way to Dusseldorf, where she'd been living for 11 years when investigators showed up. Somehow, Petra had gotten away without documentation for over 30 years. She did not have a bank account and even managed to pay all of her bills in cash. Petra had done everything she possibly could to stay off of anyone's radar. This included not socializing with any of her neighbors or co-workers in Dusseldorf. Even after she'd been discovered by police, she didn't show any interest in reuniting with her family. Despite their frantic questioning, Petra would not tell officers why she had disappeared in the first place. Her father had since died. When asked if she wanted to reunite with her mother and brother, she said she did not. Gabriel Nagy In January of 1987, Gabriel Nagy was living in Sydney with his wife Pamela. 
Together, the couple had two children, Stephen, then 11, and Jennifer, nine. Apparently, the family lived a comfortable life, supported by Nagy's job as a shop fitter. Meanwhile, he was studying to become an accountant. On January 21st, 1987, Gabriel called his wife at home and told her he would be coming home for lunch, but he never arrived. Gabriel was the kind of person who always told someone whether he was coming home or not, so this was very strange. The next day, people found Gabriel's vehicle abandoned at the roadside. Apparently, the car was now just a burnt out shell. Authorities found that Gabriel had withdrawn some money from his account after two weeks of his disappearance, and it was found that he had soon after bought camping supplies at a new castle store, but then the trail went cold. And for more than 20 years, Pamela and her children were left to wonder what had happened to him. Since he didn't communicate for so long, his family started to believe he was dead. Then, some 23 years after Nagy's disappearance, after trying to crack the cold case for over 10 years, Senior Constable Georgia Robinson decided to get Nagy declared dead. However, Robinson wanted to go through her files again for the last time, and this time, she found a clue in the form of a Medicare card registered to a Gabriel Nagy. Apparently, a Gabriel Nagy had recently undergone operations on his eye, and Australia's health authority Medicare had documented the procedures. Soon, the records were traced to a man also known as Ron Saunders, who had recently begun using the name Gabriel Nagy. When the police questioned him, Nagy told them that he had no idea what she was talking about. Police were certain that the man was indeed the missing Gabriel Nagy, but that he genuinely seemed to have no memory of anything that had happened. It was soon found that Gabriel had suffered a serious injury at the back of his head, which was the possible cause of his amnesia. At the time, Gabriel was living and working at Mackey's River of Life Church. However, he had spent much of the past two decades homeless and wandering from place to place with no real idea of where he came from or where he was going. After doing odd jobs and sleeping on the streets for a long time, a pastor saw something in Nagy and decided to give him the job of a caretaker in his church. Little by little, Memories had started to come back to him, and he'd even started to remember his real name after having lived under a pseudonym for decades. The pastor helped Nagy get a Medicare card in his original name, and that's when he was found by police. Nagy was subsequently reunited with his family after 25 years of being missing, and he was delighted to restore his relationship with his family and return to the life he used to live. Nguyen Thai Vaughn In 1992, Vaughn was a 16-year-old living in Hanoi, Vietnam. She was a high school student and top in her class. Vaughn was a pretty and an early developed girl compared to the others. She spent most of her time going out and partying with her friends. One day, Vaughn returned home after midnight. Her mother, Miss Ha, locked her out of the home as punishment for coming home past curfew. On that night, she disappeared, and the family reported her missing to police. An extensive search was carried out, but to no avail, Vaughn would remain missing for 21 years. Then, in 2013, Vaughn's uncle was buying vegetables when a woman approached him and asked him about Miss Ha's residence. The woman said that she was Ha's missing daughter, Noon Tai Vaughn. Vaughn's uncle ran to Miss Ha's home to tell her the good news. Ha thought that her brother was joking. She only believed that her daughter had returned when she saw Vaughn with her own two eyes. When questioned, Vaughn told them that on the night after not being allowed into the home, Vaughn went to a karaoke bar with her friends where she met a woman named Ton, who convinced Vaughn and her friends to go to Lang Sun, a northern border province. Going to Lang Sun, Vaughn and her friends entered a karaoke bar to sing and drink. The next morning, Vaughn woke up to find herself in a house in China, along with three other girls. The woman who had captured the girls told them to get married to Chinese men, some of whom were 50 to 60 years older than them. 
When Vaughn refused, she was beaten and forced to kneel on jackfruit thorns, on bull bottoms until her knees bled. The other girls were afraid of whipping, so they agreed to marry the old men. A few days later, Vaughn was introduced to a 70-year-old man. They placed a bowl of rice and a bowl of stool in front of her and asked her if she agreed to marry the man. They said that if she agreed to marry him, she could eat the rice, but if not, she had to eat the feces. Vaughn refused and was forced to eat feces. The next day, five men were brought to the house, including a younger man of around 40. Vaughn chose to marry that man as she was afraid of having her hoof tendon cut if she kept resisting. Vaughn was then blindfolded and transported to the man's house in a remote area where she was forced to live as a wife of the 40-year-old Chinese man. After just one year, she bore a child. Vaughn asked her husband's permission to work as a builder's worker's assistant to seek the opportunity to eventually run away. She failed to escape twice. After each failure, she was beaten by her husband. After the third try, she was chained for two weeks. It was then that Vaughn met a Vietnamese driver who worked for a farm near her house. Vaughn told the driver her story and asked for his help. The driver drove by Vaughn's house several times and made Vaughn's husband believe that his car was broken down and developed ways to rescue her, but his effort failed. Then, a few days later, the driver decided to rescue Vaughn by putting her into a cage together with pigs on a truck. Vaughn took with her a dose of rat poison to use in case she was seized again by her husband. Running for 70 kilometers, the driver took Vaughn out of the cage when she eventually fainted. He left the truck and hired a cab and kept moving to the Vietnam-China border. After 100 kilometers, Vaughn finally regained consciousness. After saying goodbye to the cab driver, the truck driver and Vaughn traveled for three months, begging for food. Finally, they arrived at the Vietnam-China border, but were out of money. There they met a kind-hearted taxi driver who took them both through the border to Vietnam for free. Returning to Vietnam, Vaughn realized she had nowhere to go because her parents were over 80 years old or perhaps they had already died. The truck's driver advised Vaughn to just go home. She gave Vaughn some money and said, if your parents died and your family does not accept you, you can come back to live with me. Vaughn returned to Cam Ten Street to seek her family. After 21 years, she was back in Hanoi and started asking people the way to the small alley where her house was located previously. The sixth person that she asked for information was her uncle. They did not recognize each other until Vaughn said that she was Miss Ha's daughter. After 21 years, Vaughn and her family were finally reunited.